There is only one earth and many religions. So why are we so bad at getting along? What are the reasons for building bridges between the different faith groups in the UK or wherever you live? I want to start answering that last question by talking about the London Underground, the Tube, one of the iconic features of London life. Every day, it takes me from my home to my office in the centre of London. And I've been using the Tube for many years, since I would travel to school as a schoolboy from the age of 11. Several years later, when I'd started working life, a terrible thing happened. On Thursday, the 7th of July, 2005, three bombs were detonated on the London Underground within 50 seconds of each other. Along with a fourth bomb on a London bus, a total of 52 people were killed from 18 different nationalities and many different faith groups. The perpetrators were religious extremists. They see faith as divisive, violent, and hate-filled. I see it as the opposite. I remember that day well. I was travelling into work on the tube when I heard that the bombs had gone off. That day became known as 7-7. But thankfully, that's not typical of my experience, nor of the tube. When I started using the tube all those years ago, travelling into school, as I got on the carriage, I would see before me London's diversity and all the powerful symbols of faith, cross, hijab, turban, skullcap. And then I would arrive at school. I, as a Jewish pupil, would be in a class of pupils from a variety of faiths and ethnic backgrounds. My classmates included Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, as well as other Jewish pupils. Every day, I was doing interfaith without even realizing it. Fifteen years later, I got a job working for a religious leader, the chief rabbi. Interfaith, that is, the relations between different faith groups, formal and informal, was part of my role. And ever since then, I've made time for it. Why? There are over 300 interfaith groups in the UK. Some are local, some are regional, and others are national. Some are bilateral, such as the Council of Christians and Jews, which I'm a trustee of, which is the UK's oldest national interfaith organization. Some are trilateral, particularly between the Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And others are multilateral, between all the great faiths, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Zoroastrians, Jains, Baha'is, and others. Some interfaith groups are more focused on dialogue, and others are more focused on social action. I want to talk now about the five reasons for interfaith activity. First, United Kingdom. We have an established church in the UK. King Henry VIII, whose reign began in 1509, wanted to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon. So he asked the Pope for a divorce, but this was not granted. So he set up his own church. It's amazing where a little marriage difficulty can lead. <laughs> the UK is therefore officially a Christian country. Our state occasions take place in churches, such as St Paul's Cathedral or Westminster Abbey, and are presided over by the lights of the Archbishop of Canterbury. It's really important for all the minority faith groups to relate to the host religion. If you think of a party, a social occasion, every good party needs a host, and that's the role fulfilled by the Church of England in the UK. The monarchy also plays an important role in welcoming and integrating the different faith groups. The Queen is both head of the Church of England, but also a head of a multi-faith nation. The second reason for interfaith is numbers. There's a common saying, demography is destiny. We live in a multi-faith society. The last census in 2011 showed that 70% of people identify with a faith, around 59% Christian and over 10% from the different minority faith groups. 
with particularly fast-growing populations in the Muslim and Hindu communities. Admittedly, we're not a religious nation in terms of practice. Church attendance has been declining since the 1950s, but there's still a deep residual attachment to faith. We are therefore relatively secular in terms of practice and worship, but relatively religious in terms of identity and attachment. The third reason for interfaith is issues. There are a whole host of important issues for the faith groups to talk to each other about. Interfaith is often criticised for making polite conversation over samosas and bagels, for avoiding the controversial topics, but it's really important that we address the difficult topics as well as the straightforward ones. I'm a trustee of the Council of Christians and Jews, which exists to combat anti-Semitism, prejudice against Christians and all forms of prejudice, as well as countering proselytizing groups such as Jews for Jesus. Interfaith can play a really important role in working against anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and all forms of racism and prejudice. As well as this defensive agenda, there are a whole host of positive issues for the faith groups to grapple with and talk to each other about. Wherever you look, there are problems to address. There are health-related issues, such as dementia, obesity, or mental health. There are social challenges, from knife crime to youth unemployment and homelessness, to loneliness and illiteracy. And then there are the big macro global challenges we all face, such as climate change, the refugee crisis, or economic inequality. Wherever we look, there are problems to address. And faith groups do not have all the answers, but they can be part of the solution. Society is not broken, but it's battered and bruised. And together, faith groups can play a role in healing and mending it. The fourth reason for interfaith activity is teachings. All the great faiths share common teachings about treating all fellow human beings well. Christians say, do to others what you would have them do to you. Muslims say, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. And Jews say, what is hateful to you, do not do unto others. All the great faiths share these common teachings. So whether it's the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, the Vedas, or the Guru Granth Sahib, or any of our holy scriptures, they all refer to these common principles. The Torah, for example, refers to loving your neighbor, but it also mentions loving the stranger a total of 36 times, emphasizing how challenging and important it is to relate to people who are different to us. And the fifth reason for interfaith activity is years. We need to learn from our history. There's a common saying, those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. All the faith groups in the UK have had their ups and downs. If you think of the Muslim community in the UK, the first mosque, the Shah Jahan Mosque in Woking, was established in 1889, 130 years ago. And over subsequent years, Muslim communities have integrated into the UK with ups and downs. The Catholic community has faced discrimination from Tudor times right through to the 20th century. The Jewish community, the oldest minority faith group in the UK, faced particular prejudice in the Middle Ages. There's a famous episode of Clifford's Tower in York in the year 1190, when 150 Jews were massacred because of their religion. And the Hindu and Sikh community, more recent arrivals in large numbers since the Second World War, faced racism and discrimination, but blossomed over time. All our faith groups have enriched the life and the tapestry of the nation. But interfaith can be seen as a kind of insurance policy in good times as well as bad. So there we have it, the five reasons for interfaith activity. United Kingdom, numbers, issues, teachings, and years. And if we take the first letter of each of those words, what does it spell? Unity.
Unity is not uniformity. This is not about saying we're all the same, like different brands of the same product in a supermarket. Unity refers to people's differences, but also acknowledges the common bonds of national identity or Britishness. Interfaith, therefore, is about similarity and difference. When practiced properly, it seeks to understand people's differences rather than ignoring them. But what we also have to remember is that what unites us as humans is so much greater than what differentiates us by our particular religious grouping. The great Muslim leader, Zaki Badawi, would say, if we don't talk, we fight. And some of you may remember the British Telecom advert from the 1980s, whose strapline was, it's good to talk. The quality of our relationships and friendships will help build the harmony of society and build a better earth for everyone. And it's all our responsibility to get involved. You could say that interfaith is too important to be left to priests and vicars, imams, rabbis, and other religious clerics. And it's not just for our churches, mosques, synagogues, mandirs, gurdwaras, and other places of worship. It's for everyone, and it's for everywhere. It's for our local communities, for our workplaces, our offices, our sports fields, and even public transport. Coming back to the analogy of the tube, if you think of a tube map, each line is like a religion, helping us on the journey of life. But we need stations where the lines intersect. Next time you're traveling on the tube, or any form of public transport, look around you. Notice the diversity. It's all our responsibility to get to know people who are not like us.